I'm Dylan Groven. I lead the client engagement and business development at Misty West. I've been with the company for four, over four years um, and have a master's in electrical engineering uh, a very long time ago. I used to do chip design. Uh, so I have a master's in uh, monolithic microwave integrated circuits. Um, Andreas Putz uh, has been with the company now a year and a half. A year and a half. Um, I'm the resident mathematician. Yep. Um, I did hydrogen fuse cell research before coming to Misty West a year and a half ago and then totally switched direction into uh, more data science, machine learning, uh, data filtering, and still numerical simulations, yeah. just a bit what I did previously as well. And we're very easy to distinguish. I'm the person speaking that doesn't have a German accent. So, And uh, I apologize. I've had too much coffee. I will try very hard not to uh, overdo it on the uh, speaking too fast. <laughs> so I'm going to turn off the camera. Today, <laughs> Should we have the camera now? All right, cameras are off. OK, great. So I'll meet myself as well. And then, Andreas, I'll let you take the floor. And you Sure. So uh, I'm just going to briefly introduce the table of contents. So I'm going to give a very quick uh, Mr. West introduction. And then we'll jump right into the media presentation. Um, this is uh, myself and Andreas. These uh, contact details will be included in the presentation, which will be shared with you. Um, so very briefly, uh, Misty West, we call ourselves a, a research and engineering lab. Basically, we help uh, Fortune 500 companies, entrepreneurs and hardware startups, venture capital funds, targeted endowment funds, NGOs, and publicly funded uh, government research entities to solve big problems with breakthrough technology to meet today's most ambitious societal goals. We specifically target projects that have the potential for high impact. So whether it's improving the human condition, impacting sustainability in a positive way, or otherwise moving us collectively to uh, an inclusively abundant future. Uh, we found that a much better driver of uh, success in projects, uh, especially uh, for successful project outcomes, uh, really places the common mission first uh, with revenue and profit secondary. Although not a registered uh, B Corp, we at Miss US do have a triple bottom line with people and planet coming first and profit third. Um, our team is composed of engineers, mathematicians, roboticists, physicists, scientists, and designers. One of our differentiators is that we are more heavily weighted towards core science research uh, and approaching difficult uh, giving us the ability to uh, approach challenges from a first principles approach. Um, half of our team are engineering physics majors. Um, uh, and then we have people like Andreas, who have a PhD in mathematics. Uh, we have uh, material physicists on our team with 15 years of uh, lecture and research experience on material physics. Um, and what that means is that it's within our capability if, if, uh, if you ever bumped into a project that required you know, creating uh, totally novel material with novel optical properties, uh, for example, we could, that's within our, our, our capability spec. Uh, so uh, we, we uh, were lucky enough to poach uh, uh, a researcher and ex-professor at a university um, who's able to build uh, reactors for novel uh, optical materials. So, you know, we, we can build things like that from scratch. Um, uh, all of our clients uh, and partners and, and everybody that we work with, or even our vendor, vendors as well that we loop in, uh, we all are, are mission driven to achieving exceptional outcomes. These are some of our collaborators uh, with some well-known uh, names uh, in there, as well as uh, a mix of uh, smaller companies and startups that we work with. And also uh, companies like the WWF, uh, uh, who are actually doing some work right now building a polar bear tracker for, which is a, a, a project very near and dear to our heart. So it's a satellite tracker for tracking polar bears. Um, uh, but we find a very good dynamic between uh, the work we do with the you know, leading teams at, at the large companies, uh, taking this experience and knowledge uh, and, and uh and, and stuff that we learned and, and, and helping uh, small companies level up as well. Uh, we take a great deal of pride of, of being able to work uh, very closely and seamlessly with some of the best engineers in the world at, at some of the biggest companies in the world. And, uh, and, and we've, uh, this is something that we've achieved uh, over the last, I think, few years is, is being able to, to have that skill set. Um, this is our, our team at the moment. Uh, when I joined the company four years ago, there was only five of us. Uh, so we've had some healthy growth. I think even this is uh, is not quite up to date. We've had a couple of new hires. Uh, our headcount now is about 25 um, at the company. Uh, these are the current uh, loose tech verticals that we work in. So things like VR, AR, uh, both uh, 
things like 3D environment capture, as well as designing new VR AR peripherals, um, you know, heads-up displays, as well as controls. Uh, we're getting pulled into machine learning and AI just because of a lot of the machine vision work that we work on, uh, which is part of the discussion today. Uh, we work in IoT, uh, medical technology. We have a medical device currently in FDA research trials in the U.S. at uh, LA Children's Hospital, as well as uh, a number of other research universities or um, research hospitals. Uh, sensor fusion, clean tech, optics, robotics, uh, wearables, Bluetooth. These these are sort of the 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 themes that we've been uh, addressing over the last year uh, to two years. Uh, these are just some of our client testimonials. Um, uh, so again, a, a couple of final differentiators are that uh, you know we uh, we're really focused on um, uh, transparency within our company, uh, both internally and externally. Our internal culture is such that. You know, everybody at the company knows, you know, the company's financial situation. We know each other's salaries. Uh, we, you know, we, there's, there's no kind of hidden pockets of information within the company. And that translates into a culture that we'd like to share with our, with our clients. Um, our engagement model is very simple. We do either fixed or hourly uh, engagements, uh, depending on the, the, the client need. And, uh, our, and also in terms of intellectual property, we keep things very simple in the sense that uh, our, our par partners and collaborators own the IP. So you know, we keep it dirt simple. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Andreas, who's going to get to the meat of the, uh, the presentation today. So thank you very much. OK, thank you very much, Stern. And I'm going to take you through a bit of machine learning on the edge and the infrastructure you need to apply machine learning on the edge. And interestingly enough, the answer of whether you should do machine learning on the edge is very simple, but has changed in the last couple of years significantly. So a couple of years ago, the question whether you should do machine learning on the edge was very simple to answer. And the, the answer was just don't do it. You don't have the computational resources to do it. It's way too expensive. Uh, the way to do this transfer all your data off your device to machine learning off the device and then transfer the results back. Um, so I would say a year and a half ago or two years ago with the new generation of the Raspberry Pis coming up and specifically with the NVIDIA TX2 series, which have a dedicated machine learning chip on edge devices on small compute platforms, the answer has changed from that, that don't do it to yes, you can do it, just don't train on the edge. So you basically would load training data in your normal machine learning environment. You load the training sets, you train the network and you would load the trained network into your edge devices. But now as the TX2s and some of the other, other platforms have become even stronger, you can actually now do some limited training on the device itself. And the way you typically do this, you add a pre-trained network onto the device, and then you have a cheap reinforcement learning uh, algorithm sitting on top of that, which gradually tries to update the weights. So, in a sense, now the answer to machine learning on the edge is yes, do it. And it has been really simple to do because the packages are the same for all platforms. So whether you're ARM, CPU-based, the machine learning packages actually don't change and the install procedure doesn't change. So the only challenge on the edge is how to integrate your infrastructure. And that's a pretty significant challenge. And I take you through a typical edge project. Well, it's a toy project for the sake of this, this presentation. Um, but I will give you a little flavor of what an edge project looks like. And you basically have a couple of components, or three or five components, depending whether you, uh, how you count it. You typically have a hardware and firmware environment you can play with. And the only difference between the edge and normal compute scale is that your form factors are typically smaller, your power requirements are a lot more stringent. You typically run off a battery or just a, a wall board or some really low power supply. So you have to be able to run all your algorithms on relatively small power budgets. Um, you have microcontrollers. Everything in the microcontroller world has to offer everything the Raspberry Pi and uh, Tinkerboards have to offer. And then you have to build your firmware on top of this. So until a couple of years ago, you actually had to custom build your firmware image, and you could do this, for example, with the Yocta project. So Yocta allowed you to build a Linux distribution specifically for your hardware. So you could basically custom build 
your Linux distribution with all the packages specifically for the hardware architecture you have chosen or you designed yourself. Um, with these hardware architectures to become more and more powerful, it's actually less important to build a custom build. You can actually get away with using one of the standard builds like a Ubuntu IoT build or Raspberry IoT build, and then just write your own drivers for the kernel and bring up that operating system. Um, so application, as you're running a normal Linux operating system, or I typically run a Linux operating system, you actually have your package manager at your disposal, so you can install the applications just as a use to the desktop. Um, what we have done recently is branching out into Dockerized applications. So the Dockerized applications have the advantage that you can still access your hardware, native hardware accelerations, but you can bundle up the application very simply and you can update it very simply. And some of the applications we have played with recently were ROS, the robot operating systems, and then of course for machine learning, TensorFlow, Keras, and OpenCV specifically for machine learning and image processing. Um, and then we typically dockerize these applications. And then the next level you would like to talk to your IoT applications, and we currently use AWS, so the Amazon IoT core applications to talk to our deployed uh, infrastructures. Um, so one thing which makes the things a bit more complicated, if you have the traditional server landscape, you have your Kubernetes and Docker containers, you can update them very easily. For an edge device, it's not necessarily that easy because your device might not be online all the time. Um, you don't want to upgrade to the latest and greatest, so you would like to have a more fine grade update or control about the updates. And you would like to be able to remotely configure your devices. And we have done this through AWS IoT Core. So if you go through the hardware, I've already told you there are a couple of hardware choices you have. So in principle, you have two big choices, either something ARM-based for really low power or something x86-based. So on the ARM-based side, you have something like the um, Raspberry Pis, the other Tinker boards. Um, and then specifically, if you need high machine learning capabilities, you can actually go to something like the NVIDIA Jetson series. And that would be the TX1, TX2, or now recently the Xavier section. And they have dedicated machine learning cores on the edge infrastructure, which are still relatively powerful, but not that power hungry. And then of course you can go to an all purpose architecture like the Intel NUC or specific industrial edge computers like the uh, Hewlett Packard Enterprise or the Dell Edge series. Uh, the Edge series typically have a bit more IO configuration built in. If you stick with Intel NUC, for example, you don't have access to the GPIOs, to either see a canvas or any of the more automotive or more industrial interfaces. And this might be dictating what platform you go with. So sometimes you need 10 gig ethernet. There are very few edge platforms which allow you to do, to do 10 gig E. Sometimes you want USB 3.1, USB-C. To my knowledge, the only edge platform on ARM side which supports USB-C currently is the NVIDIA Xavier. Okay, so you have your hardware and finally you selected your hardware. Um, you would like to connect on the edge some sensors to your hardware. And there's a plenty of sensor image coming in. For example, you have all the imaging devices you can imagine, um, video cameras, standard cameras, still cameras, any type of sensor type, RGB, infrared, thermal imaging, and so on. Uh, you have recently for the past years, a vast number of 3D sensors coming online and becoming affordable something like the Intel RealSense or the Kinect, which is connected typically to the PlayStations. Um, you have devices which give you a 3D point cloud, like you have LiDARs or the cheaper version of LiDARs, some high resolution time of flight sensors. You can connect uh, GPS. Uh, you can connect real-time kinematic positioning sensors to it, some things like uh, RTK GPS for highly accurate accurate GPS measurements down to a centimeter or two, or you can collect uh, inertia measurement data through IMUs. And then a huge plenty of laser-based distance measurements. So you have a Doppler laser, you could have a sonar system, anything you can imagine you would like to put on the sensor platform or a small robot platform. 
And then if you're dealing with a robot, uh, you would like to control the robots. So typically you have to deal with an array of microcontrollers such as the Arduino or a couple of other boards. You have to interface with server drivers, motor drivers, and you have to worry about power management. So as an example platform, we at Misty West have something we call RoboSteve. And RoboSteve is the mirror image of a real Steve. So real Steve was the first Corgi we had at Misty West. And he's really cute, uh, the favorite person in the office, the first favorite, the CEO. yeah, the acting CEO, uh, the best salesperson we have, the favorite technician for customers to interact with. So real Steve is um, pretty tough not to crack. So we tried, or we are trying to deploy a small robotic platform. We call it Robotic Steve or Robo Steve. And what we're trying to do is have a platform where we can try different sensors, different robotic controls. And in the end, we would like to emulate the real Steve a little bit. So this means our robot should behave a little bit like a dog, uh, greet people, react to people, uh, be a little playful thing to interact with. So we are way not there yet, but we have some of the basics. And one thing we, we faced is how do you interface a lot of sensor data with the machine learning backend and with your controls. And one way we, we found, one good way we found to do this is through the robot operating system, ROS. So again, for RoboSteve, uh, we actually bought a chassis of Amazon. It's a Kuman chassis, I've forgotten which number it is, but it's basically a little track robot, which you see on the right on this image. Um, and then we custom made uh, plates to mount NVIDIA TX2. We basically run Ubuntu and ROS on this TX2 and all the machine learning, uh, all control patterns on this TX2. With optical sensors, we have a server mounted RGB camera um, separate. We have an RGB camera on the board directly and we have uh, 240 by 240 time of flight sensors in there. And the image you see on the monitor is actually the image you get from the time of flight sensor. So you see Danny taking the picture of the robot and you see me standing in the background um, moving the robot into place. And then we have an Arduino microcontroller to control the servers and motors and interact with the IMU. Okay, so how do you control a thing like this? Um, you can write your custom software. Um, you can use any kind of off-the-shelf component you can find. We decided to try the robot operating system. And the robot operating system is basically not an operating system as such. It's a flexible framework to write robot software and integrate with the development environment that already exists. So currently, there are about 3,000 packages available through ROS, and they have everything from camera drivers to SLAM algorithms for um, uh, synchronous localization and mapping um, to 3D reconstruction algorithms and also some machine learning algorithms. It's designed for distributed computing, so you can actually have multiple compute cores. And we have done a project where we actually had six NVIDIA TX2s interacting with a centralized uh, Intel architecture. So we had seven ROS machines running and interacting with each other. Um, this interaction happens very effectively. It goes through TCP IP. Um, so it's pretty efficient. You can encrypt it if you needed to. Um, and you just basically bandwidth limited through whatever network ports you have on your devices. Uh, some of the caveats currently are out of the box. It supports Python 2.7. Uh, you can use Python 3, the Python 3x series as well, but this requires some tinkering. Uh, the major drawback currently is if you're a fan of the Anaconda Python environment, it does not play well with Anaconda. So currently I have to deactivate my Anaconda environment and then start my ROS environment up and then it works, but it doesn't work well with Anaconda. There's a re-implementation being made right now, which is called ROS2, which is a more modern redesign of ROS, and it looks very, very promising, but it's not quite ready. So I think another month and another couple of months, it's probably going to be ready in a couple of months and going to switch from ROS1 to ROS2. 
So the ROS core components are basically a communication infrastructure, which are nodes. And your nodes encapsulate all your computational tasks. So if you do machine learning, this machine learning happens within the nodes. If you do image processing, that happens within the nodes. You can connect an image processing node with a machine learning node. So you do some basic pre-processing first and then connect it to your machine learning node and then connect your machine learning node to your control nodes to control movement. And all your nodes together form a compute graph. It's designed to be very fault tolerant. If a node dies, it tries to restart itself. Uh, you get error messages and you can create fallback scenarios when these nodes uh, fail. Communication happens through topics. So topics are basically your message parsing systems and they have a publish and subscribe model. Um, and you can basically just declare message formats which allow you to specify image messages, control messages, and it checks whether your message is correct or not. If you need synchronous uh, communication, there is something called services, and you can connect different nodes with services, and they can establish a synchronous communication pipeline as well. Then robot uh, ROS comes with some robot-specific capabilities, like it comes with a standard library for video data, for odometry, for 3D sensing, for mapping. Um, it comes with a geometry library, which basically tells you where is what on your robot. So where is my camera compared to my drivetrain? And it, it allows to translate between these coordinate systems. It comes with a pretty significant diagnostic suite and with post estimation navigation and mapping tools. And then it comes with a toolbox for running and launching your robot, for visualizing, all the things going on in a robot and visualizing your environment. So the main uh, visualization environments are OQT and Arvis. And then it comes with a software build system, CMake and CatCam. Uh, so for Robo Steve, so we basically have ROS nodes for cameras and time of light sensors. We have a ROS node to communicate with the Arduino and the motors, and we have a ROS node for indoor mapping. And this is a little diagram of what we already have implemented. So all the vision system, the vision stack is there, the microcontroller stack is there, and we're currently working on the machine learning components of our stack. So if you want to try out the demos, we actually have created a Bitbucket repository. And everything you need to run uh, for this presentation is actually in this Bitbucket repository. And you can create your ROS environment and all the environments directly from within this repository. I'm also going to hyperlink the presentation inside the repository as well, so you have all the information you're going to need. Um, so basically, for the rest of the presentation, about 30 minutes, I would like to take you through a little 2D force of ROS, uh, machine learning, and AWS, and I've created a sequence of screencasts, which I hope are going to show up. Um, so for example, if you want to try this out on your own, uh, just clone this repository, initialize the submodules, and update the submodules. So if you're not familiar with Git, the submodules are a very easy way to brings third-party repositories into your environment. So basically, you can specify things like the AWS MQTT bridge at a specific revision and reference this in your own repository and freeze this reference and then always build from this reference. Um, I've built a little installer script. So there is a script called TMLS install required. And if you execute this at sudo, it will install ROS for you. Uh, on a Ubuntu 18.04 platform. It will install ROS, it will install TensorFlow, Keras, um, all the machine learning applications you're going to need, and it's going to install all the AWS clients you're going to need for this demo. And whilst this is executing, so this takes about four minutes to run. And after four minutes, if everything works well, you should have a working ROS environment on your system. The way I have structured my ROS environment is 
that you need to set specific paths. And I have created a little environment script called TMLS environment. And if you source this environment script in your bash, it will create uh, all the proper path settings. So with this, your installation doesn't pollute the rest of the system. The downside is currently every, th every time you want to run anything from this demo, you have to resource this environment. Okay. So, Ross, I want to give you a little playful introduction to Ross. And the first thing people typically run on Ross is the turtle simulator. And the turtle simulator is a small little turtle you can move on the screen. So what I've done here is I source my TMLS environment. I start a ROS core. So the ROS core is the central computation process of ROS. And then in a new bash window, I run the turtle sim node. And the turtle sim node will bring up a little window with a little turtle in it. And the turtle will be static because we haven't connected any controls to it yet. So this should come up in a second. So you have your turtle simulator up and running, but the turtle is not moving. So in a new bash, I again source the environment. And then I load um, I load desktop controls for the turtle. So I do a ROS run uh, turtle sim. I've forgotten the command right now. So I should remember this in a second. So the node is called uh, turtle sim and it's turtle teleop. And that gives you a little keyboard which allows you to move your turtle around. So this looks pretty simple, uh, but it's actually the same process for every robot. This turtle is controlled by something called the twist message, which basically prescribes your three uh, linear motion directions plus the three angular momentum directions. And this would be universal for every robot. So you can control any robot um, with the twist messages. So yes, and this is your first first little intro into ROS. And if you look at the compute graph, you see there is your teleop turtle node and your turtle sim node. And the tele operations node is broadcasting uh, the command velocity to the turtle, sim uh, turtle simulator. And the turtle simulator moves the turtle based on your command velocity. And this would be true for any robot you would have. So this becomes pretty tedious. You first have to start the ROS core and then start all your nodes, make sure everything interacts correctly. You will have to start many, many bash shells to get everything running. So what ROS allows you to do, uh, ROS allows you to create launch scripts. And these launch scripts obstruct the launch of many nodes and many interacting topics. So instead of having to go into each node and launch the node separately, you can write the sequence into launch script and then just launch uh, the launch script itself. And I've done this here with a sm slightly more advanced version of the turtle. So what this thing does, again, I sourced my TMLS environment. Then I run ROS launch. And I would like to run a specific script from turtle sense. So I would like to run turtle tf2 sensor.launch. And what this basically does, it creates three turtles. One turtle is just going to move in a circle. The second turtle is controlled with the keyboard. And the third turtle tries to catch up with the second turtle. So that's what see what you see happening on the screen right now. So there's a little ODE solver built into the turtle sim, which tries to mimic the direction controls of the first turtle. So if you look at the compute graph for this, the compute graph looks a tiny bit more complicated. Um, and the compute graph for this will grow the more complex your robot is going to become. OK, so these are some of the basics of ROS. Really simple, 
we could get a turtle to move. Um, we could interact with it through the keyboard. We could control a second turtle just moving in a circle. And we have a third turtle trying to catch up with our second turtle. Now you would like to combine some machine learning with ROS. And basically, we have done this with a very, very simple problem. One of them is object recognition, and one of them is actually face detection. And I've written a simple ROS package for image recognition, for object recognition, and for face detection. So the machine learning tools everyone is using at the moment, or some of the most popular machine learning tools, are TensorFlow and Keras. Um, TensorFlow is co-developed by Google. It's an open source software package for really high performance numerical computing, specifically for machine learning. It has a very strong interface for hardware acceleration, so you can accelerate on massively many CPUs, GPUs, and now on Google's uh, tensor-optimized architecture called uh, TPUs, tensor processing units. That's developed and backed by Google, and actually has an API for most languages, so at least for Python or uh, C++ is an API available. Um, there is a second package called Keras, and that's a high-level application interface to Keras. And it sits on top of TensorFlow, Theano, and CNTK, and a couple of other lower-level um, machine learning packages. But for this demo, I'm actually purely using it with TensorFlow. The other nice thing about Keras, it actually comes with a nice library of pre-trained models. And as I wanted to do something very simple, I used the pre-trained models. Um, if you have any vision, vision projects, OpenCV is a very good package to work with. It has a huge uh, user base, one of the biggest open source communities in the world. And written in C and C++, extremely well accelerated through the CPUs and GPUs for image processing. Also, development is backed by Google and other big corporations. And it has an API for C++, Python, Java, and a couple other backends. Um, ROS, in fact, uses OpenCV for most of the image transport going on in the background. And OpenCV was the go-to package for everything to do with traditional computer vision. So pipeline for traditional image processing tasks uh, like coarsening, image segmentation, image registration, and so on. It has a pretty good interface to stream video devices like all your cameras on your system. Uh, since version 3, it actually has its own machine learning library specifically for object and face detection. It can also be used in combination with Keras, TensorFlow, and some of the other machine learning libraries. OK, so the package I've written is called Demo Keras, and it's again available on our Bitbucket repository. And it's actually only a couple of hundred lines at most of these lines or in fact, comments. If I increase the font size here a bit. Uh, so the central package here is this demo Keras clause. And this clause is pretty simple. Um, I have an initializer, uh, which just predefines a couple of things, like I would like my image size to be rescaled to 224 by 224. But why do this, I will show in a second. Um, I generate a few things for MQTT. And then I initialize my Keras model. And this is really just three lines. So you would do this as in any Keras application. So I, pre I load a model, and I, the model is ResNet 50. Um, and I load predefined weights from ImageNet. Then I create, a, create the predictor function, and I create my compute graph and I return the model in a compute graph um, to my initializing function. Then I initialize OpenCV, and OpenCV initialize with two hard cascades. And I will explain this in a second. So one, I would like to detect faces. So I load a host cascade for face detection, and I load a host hard cascade for eye detection. Next, I initialize ROS. And the only thing I do in ROS, I create a couple of uh, modules for communication with ROS. So I publish what object has been detected, what probability I think this object has been detected. I will broadcast the image, and I will broadcast the detected face. And this is basically most of the main code. The only difference 
Ross has compared to everything else is that you have to code your pipeline into something called a Ross callback. So in the end, when you actually start Ross with your node, you create a subscriber and you tell it to subscribe to the USB image stream. And you would like it to execute the ROS callbacks. So every, th every time an image is received, it should execute your callback function. And if it's just a function, you would have to define a lot of global variables. So the way I've done this, I have wrapped my, all my image processing and machine learning up into a classifier class, which is the demo Keras class. I instantiate the class, and one of the class members is actually the subscriber. So you see this defined ROS callback. This is actually the callback function I define. And this is what I hand over to ROS. So this allows the callback function to have access to all the members of the class and all the data structures of the class without you having to do any um, playing with global variables. So if you look at some of the demo codes, some of the demo codes, instead of defining a class, they define a ROS callback function alone, and then they make every single variable global. Um, I don't like global variables because I think it makes the code very unreadable. So I've solved this instead of going to global variables, I define my class, I define the callback function within the class, and then I hand over the callback function of the class. And that's all you need to do. So now you have this code within your ROS build environment, and you need to build it, and ROS provides a packet called catkin, which allows you to build this environment. And I've just uh, quickly demonstrated this. So your source environment, you go into your catkin workspace, which contains all your source directory, contains all the third party packages, and then the only thing you need to do is do a catkin make. And we will do this in a second. So cat can make, will build all the packages. If you have C++ code in there, it will build the C++ code. If you have Python code in there, it will build and install this code. And now if you next to the TNL environment, you will see that the TMLS ROS sources have been found and they're available to your code. Okay, so the two things are implemented for um, detection for machine learning in this platform is an OpenCV-based face detection. And what it basically did, I followed the tutorial on OpenCV. So it's a very, very simplistic detection of faces. What it basically does, it's looking for these kind of features. So it's looking for horizontal light dark transitions, for vertical light dark transitions called the edge features. It's looking for transition light, dark, light, horizontal or light, dark, light, or vertical, or it's looking for kind of a chessboard-like pattern within this image. And when it finds this, it uses a machine learning-based algorithm to detect whether the sequence of these found edge features actually resemble a face or not. If it detects a face, it will actually start the second level, it will start the eye detection, and it will try to start detecting eyes uh, in my face. And I've coded this up briefly here. So you again, source your TMLS environment. Everything is already built. Um, you launch. Um, you launch the demo code. So you do a ROS launch, demo Keras, uh, demo Keras launch. And this now starts the image processing stream. So it will stream your webcam to the machine learning module. And then hopefully it will return an image with, um, with your face highlighted. And if you use RQT, you can use the image view of RQT to use the CV face. And now you see my face sometimes being recognized. As I said, this is a very simplistic uh, machine learning algorithm for your face. And this runs on almost any platform, Raspberry Pi, um, even on a microcontroller. So it's a very, very cheap way to take traffic. It's not the best way, but it's very cheap. Oh, 
Okay. So with this, you have a very simple face recognition which runs on almost any platform. So if you would like to get a little fancier, uh, you can now go into object detection. And one of the things I've implemented here is ResNets, which stands for Residual Network. It's 50 layers deep. Um, and basically, ResNet is this architecture on the top line. And it basically consists out of 34 connected layers, almost all of which are um, um, convolutional neural networks, except for the first and the last layer. The last layer is a fully connected thousand uh, output layer. And that layer tries to map your image into thousand categories. So there are a thousand objects you could theoretically detect. The reason it's called uh, residual is because it tries to avoid your gradient for backpropagation to become small. So one of the problems if you have a deep network is once you try to backpropagate the error to train, the error becomes very, very small the deeper your, your compute graph is. So with the residual network, you're actually bypassing some of these layers uh, with the identical transformation. And you basically make your network shorter. And you can choose how much of the information flows into the convolutional neural network or how much flows into the bypass layer. Um, and with that, you can control how much of your gradient in the back propagation is going to survive. This is very simplistically put how the uh, REST networks. And I'm using pre-trained weights from ImageNet. And if you run this again, um, I publish the recognized objects um, to a ROS topic called Object Detected. And you actually see the detected objects. So it's designed for an object which is very clearly visible. And in my clustered office, this is not really happening. So you see when I try to hold this book into the foreground, it also detects something in the background and thinks it's a coffee mug. So if you have very noisy background, this is not the best detector to choose. Uh, but eventually, it actually thinks it's a bookshop. It works really well on the cat. Um, so I've just put an image of a cat on my uh, tablet and showed it to the camera. That's why it's so overexposed. But you see it's, it thinks it's a cat, but it can't decide whether it's a tabby or uh, forgotten what the other cat was. And then the dog is getting recognized as a Labrador, Labrador retriever. And this all happens within ROS and within a couple of lines of code. So the last 10 minutes, and I've taken more time on ROS than I, than I was hoping to, um, I would like you, I would like to take you a little bit through AWS IoT. So what we've done so far was running everything on your edge device. There is no communication happening. If you want information of this device, you have to somehow SSH into device, uh, create a remote terminal, and uh, from there, uh, control your ROS interface. Uh, you can do the same. You can spin up a simple web interface. But it would be nice if it would interact directly with some basic web platforms. And the web platform we are currently with is AWS IoT but every cloud platform now has its own version of the IoT platform. So there is Azure IoT, there is Google IoT. They all work relatively similar. Um, whatever is simple is in one is difficult in the other and vice versa. We haven't found the golden bullet with this yet. Whatever you're comfortable with, stick to it and try to make it worth of it. Um, <laughs> so just as a short, short introduction, AWS IoT connects edge devices, or in fact, any remote devices to the AWS cloud infrastructure. And the way it does this is through a communication engine called MQTT, which is a very lightweight communication protocol, and a series of authentication and authorization routines. 
So basically, you need a set of security certificates and their X509 certificates, similar certificates to what SSH is using. And you have to load those onto your device. And every time you communicate, you have to attach these certificates to your MQTT communication bridge. And they encrypt your communication, but they also authenticate your device against the AWS IoT gateway. So if someone hijacks your certificate, they have access to the IoT part of AWS, impersonating whatever device the certificates have belonged to. So you really have to protect those certificates on your device. And in AWS directly, they have a couple of features built in. So something to have a rules engine, and the rules engine allows AWS to create actions based on incoming information. So if you send something through MQTT topic, you can create listeners, and these listeners will execute something in the back end um, with respect to the information coming in. They call this the rules engine. Sometimes useful, sometimes it's not. The other important thing is the device shadow. So the device shadow is a offline state of your device, the last known state of your device. So if your device happens to be offline, your applications would still like to interact with the device. They can use the shadow to do so. So and instead of interacting directly with the device, you always interact with the shadow. And the shadow itself, once the device is online, will interact with the device. So for example, you can set your device to report uh, that ROS is running and it will create an entry in the device shadow that ROS is running, but the application would like to turn ROS off. So the application will set a desired state for ROS to be off. And next time the device comes online, it compares the reported state to the desired state and it will try to bring the reported state into the desired state. By default, everything is happening through MQTT. However, you can use, for example, they built a three AWS client to access everything else on AWS. So if you want to upload S3 buckets, you can do this through the Boto3 Python client. The only problem is the Boto3 client doesn't accept X509 tokens. So you have to do this convoluted scheme where you use your X509 token to request an AWS v3 security token and then use this in the remaining part of your go to three session um, i have detailed this out in the repository but i don't think we come to this today um, so the device site is built on top of the aws iot device sdk i've used the python port there's all the java library there is a cnc plus plus library for this and then for everything else i use go to three and for AWS Cloud, I actually built it with something called CloudFormation and Cloud Code Pipeline. One thing we have found for our projects is, yes, you can click your AWS structure together by hand, but if you want to reproduce it, it's very difficult to reproduce about a thousand mouse clicks. Um, so there's a way that you can actually upload your cloud infrastructure to either S3 or Bitbucket and it your cloud can actually be built from your Bitbucket repository. And that's the way you have done this. There are a few caveats. The SDK only contains the MQTT framework. So everything you really want this thing to do, you have to implement yourself. It doesn't come with a system daemon. So you have to write the daemon yourself. It doesn't come with a job manager. You have to write the job manager yourself. It really just comes with a communication framework. Everything else you have to implement yourself. I was a little bit disappointed by this. I was expecting the SDK to come at least with a client. Um, but no, you have to implement all of this uh, from scratch. And my other big detriment, code pipeline and Bitbucket do not work out of the box. You have to jump through a couple of hoops to make this work. Code pipeline and GitHub work out of the box. So you can actually update or put your cloud infrastructure onto GitHub. And every time you change the text file, it will actually update to cloud infrastructure. And I think I have a couple of videos where I took you through how to set up the cloud. Um, perhaps I just want to show you that cloud formation template. Um, this is something we really, really liked and really helped us a lot in development. 
and it's basically a proce procedural design of your AWS environment. Basically, it's a, a YAML file which specifies each component in your cloud. For example, if you want to create an IAM role, you can textually define your IAM role. You can even create this from point and click. There is a Firefox plugin which records the template whilst you click your environment together. And this is really, really helpful. And what you can do now, you can zip your template, you upload it to an S3 bucket, and then create a pipeline which reads the S3 bucket and creates your AWS instance from this S3 bucket. And everything gets created automatically. Really, really nice, really, really convenient, relatively hassle-free. Every time you update your zip file, it will actually look at the delta of your current cloud instance and your previous cloud instance, and it will update your AWS environment accordingly. If you have GitHub linked every time you push to this branch, it will update your cloud instance. This was really a lifesaver for us. It allows to, uh, to deploy virtual identical environments very, very quickly. And if you set all this up, I just want to take away one last video. If you get this, all of this running, you can actually broadcast your ROS topics to AWS Cloud. And this is what I've done in this little demo. So I start my object detection algorithm again. And then I connect it with two commands to the AWS Cloud interface. I republish the topic to the topic which gets published to AWS. And then I check out my AWS IoT environment. I look at my device and you see in the right-hand side in the shadow state that it shows the Keras objects that detects a modem, a binder, oscilloscope with a certain probability in the background. So you can send, I've sent the detected objects up to AWS Cloud, but in principle, you can send any type of information to your AWS backend, and you can send this information back to your ROS environment as well. And this is a very, really, really nice and simple way, a relatively simple way to communicate safely with your ROS instance through AWS. And this, I think this is all the time I have.